Welcome to Hollywood. The Armed Forces Radio and Television Service brings you the Hollywood Radio Theater, starring Rock Hudson and Barbara Rush in Great Expectations. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. This evening, we present these two fine universal international artists in Charles Dickens' famous story, Great Expectations. Now, Act One of Great Expectations, starring Rock Hudson as Pip and Barbara Rush as Estella. This dark and tangled narrative has its beginning in the year 1821. I was 12 years of age, living in the south of England with my sister and her husband. Late, one gusty autumn afternoon, I visited the village churchyard where my mother and father are buried. Suddenly, from behind one of the tombstones... Keep still, you little devil, or I'll cut your throat. He was looming over me, huge and horrible, his great wrists shackled in a chain, an escaped convict. Tell us your name, quick. Pip, Pip, sir. You're lying, that's no name. Oh, it is, sir. Pip, it really is, but they call me Pip. Show us where you live. Three miles, sir, across the marshes. Where's your father? Yes, sir. This is his grave. Your mother? Here, too, sir. Who do you live with, then? Supposing you're kindly let live, which I ain't made up my mind about yet. With my sister, sir. Mrs. Joe Gargery, wife of Joe Gargery the blacksmith. Blacksmith, eh? You know what a file looks like? A file? Yes, sir. Do you know what Whittles is? Yes, sir. Food, sir. Then you get me a file and you get me Whittles or I'll have your heart and liver out. Try, sir. And you'll bring them whittles and that file to me in this churchyard tomorrow morning at daylight. Yes, sir. And never a word of having seen such a person as me. No, sir. There's another man hid with me around here. He has a secret way of getting at a boy and tearing him wide open. Now, say heaven strike you dead if you breathe a word. Heaven strike me dead if I breathe a word. Yeah. Now get you home. What sleep I had that night was plagued with the dreadful vision of the convict waiting for me in the churchyard. I was up long before dawn. From the pantry, I stole a pork pie and some brandy, and from Joe's shop, a file. I ran most of the way. It gave me less time to think. I, I, I'm here, sir. You brought no one with you? No, sir. This is for you, sir. What? Pork pie and Joe's brandy. Here, give it here. Uh, I think you have the chills, sir. Uh, uh, not much of your opinion by uh, the food now. The food. Are you starved, sir? <laughs> I, I'm glad to see you enjoy it, sir. I... Thank you, boy. Thank you, I do. Aren't you going to leave any for him? Uh, him? Your friend, the other man. I did not say he was a friend of mine. Anyway, he's gone. Uh... Uh, now give us the file, boy. If there isn't anything else, sir, please go home now. Yes, go home. I, I'm beholden to you. Thank you, boy. Thank you. All day long, the mounted soldiers swarmed over the marshes, searching for the convicts. They were captured, both of them. On the way back to the prison ship, the sergeant's horse lost a shoe, so they stopped at Joe's blacksmith shop. With them was the convict I had helped. So, you caught them both, Charlie. What happened to the other one? The corporals took him on ahead. We'd not have got this one if it wasn't for the help that somebody gave us. Hey, Magwitch? Ain't right, right, right now? Ah, uh, that's right enough. Uh, what are you looking at the boy for? No reason. Sergeant. I wish to say something respecting this here escape. Ah, you do, eh? Well, say it. It might prevent some persons from suffering suspicions now that I know it was my shipmate who turned me in. Well? I I stole some food from this blacksmith's house last night. You were in my house last night? Yeah. I stole a dram of liquor and a pork pie. Like a pork 
Aye, my missus fair tore the house down looking for that. I'm sorry to say I ate your pie. Oh, you're welcome to it, as ever it were mine. We wouldn't have you starved to death, would us, Pip? No, Joe, no. Now, get back to your forge, blacksmith. It's getting late. It was a year later when an adventure of quite another sort befell me. My great-uncle Pumblechook came to the house on a very mysterious errand. That's all I know, Mrs. Joe. Miss Havisham sent word that she wants the boy to call on her. You hear that, boy? Yes, ma'am. Uh, but, Uncle, it don't make sense. What she want him for in that great old house? Pip, do you know who Miss Havisham is? The strange lady who nobody sees. Aye, and she's mad. Ain't she, Mrs. Joe? She may be mad, but she's rich enough to make the boy's fortune. The message said she wants Pip to come to her house and play. Then he'd better go and play or I'll work him good. Get to the pump, boy. Get to the pump and scrub till you shine. There's the fine big gate, Grand Levy. So ring the bell. Ring it, boy. What name? Pumblechook. Quite right. She's coming. It's a girl. First girl you've ever seen, is it? No, sir. Then restrain your observation, sir, till invited. This is Pip, young lady. So this is Pip, is it? Come in, Pip. Not you. Only him. Eh? Not me. Go away. Come along, boy. The house was like nothing I had ever seen before or since. With a musty smell and dust and cobwebs everywhere as if the house had, had died. Not a ray of sunlight. Only the glimmer of a candle in the hand of the little girl and the ring of our footsteps on the stone. This door, boy, over here. Uh, uh, do you miss? Don't be silly. I'm not going in. Who is it? Who's there? Pip, Mum. Mr. Pumblechook's boy. Come to play. Let me look at you. Well, you aren't afraid of a woman who has never seen the sun since before you were born? No, Miss Havisham. Look at my hand. What do I touch when I put my hand here? Your heart. Broken. My broken heart. Sometimes I have sick fancies, boy. And I have had a fancy that I would like to see someone play. Well, play. Play. Estella, come here. Play with this boy. With him, a common laboring boy? Look at his boots. You can break his heart, Estella. Boy, play cards with her. Here. Cards. Deal the cards, boy. Yes, miss. But coarse hands. Sorry, miss, I... Now, look what you've done. You've dropped the cards. Excuse me, I'll pick them up. You stupid, clumsy, laboring boy. <laughs> she has many hard things to say of you, Pip. Have you nothing to say of her? I think she is very insulting. Anything else? I think she is very pretty. Anything else? I think I should like to go home now. And never see her again? Even though she is so pretty. Uh, I'm not sure that I shouldn't like to see her again. But I think I should like to go home now. You shall go home in time. Play the game out. Thereafter, in accordance with Miss Havisham's wishes, I made innumerable visits to the great house. Each time, with her cruel, tormenting smile, Estella would meet me and take me to Miss Havisham. Well, boy? Well, miss? Am I pretty today? Yes, I think you are very pretty. Am I insulting? Not so much as Tuesday, miss. Not so much, though. So. Take that, you coarse little monster. What do you think of me now? I won't tell you. Why don't you cry again, you little wretch? You cried the first day, didn't you? I saw you. You went through the gate crying. She'll never cry because of you again. Open the door. Today she's in there. This was one of the many rooms I had never before entered. In the candlelight, I saw an immense table with chairs about and laden with dishes and fine silver. Seated at the head of the table was Miss Havisham. Do you know what that is in the center of the table? No, ma'am. A wedding cake. My wedding cake, Pip. 
Long before you were born, it was placed there. It and I have worn away together. The mice have gnawed at it, Pip. But sharper teeth have gnawed at me. There, there, boy. Run along now, run along. You'll find Estella in the garden. Estella was not in the garden. A boy was there, a stranger, stripped to the waist. He said Estella had sent for him to fight me and teach me manners. So I fought with him and cut his eye and sent his nose to bleeding. He was very gracious about it. Well, you won all right. Fight's over. Can't I help you? I didn't mean no to. No, thanks. I'm <coughs> tip-top. Can't understand how you did it, though. You're leaving? Oh, yes. No point in staying now, is there? Good afternoon, then. Same to you. Boy. Where are you? Over here, and don't ask. When I call you, come. Yes, miss. You whipped the village boy. I had no wish to fight at all. But you whipped him. So you may kiss me. Thank you. Go home. It's no use. You'll never become a gentleman. I would never be a gentleman any more than I could give up running to Miss Havisham's every time she gave me leave to do so. And each time, Estella hovered about. But never again did she tell me I might kiss her. I hate you, boy. I hate you. My admiration of her knew no bounds. And scarcely a night went by without my falling asleep with the image of her lovely face before my eyes. Then came a day when I went to Havisham House with slow feet and heavy heart. Can't come to see you anymore, Miss Havisham. I've heard the news, Pip. Your sister has died. Yes. She treated you miserably. You'll do better without her. But I have to help Joe now, Miss Havisham, at the forge. An apprentice blacksmith? You? Yes, Miss Havisham. Since this is your last visit here, some golden sovereigns. Thank you. You've earned them well. Thank you. Estella, show the boy out. Goodbye, Miss Havisham. I heard what you told her. You had better say goodbye to me, too, because I'm going away. Going away? To France, to be educated. France? Well, aren't you sorry I'm going? Yes, Estella. Very sorry. Well, who have we here? A boy, Mr. Jaggers. A boy? From the neighborhood, eh? Yes, sir. Miss Havisham sent for me, sir. Well, behave yourself, then. I have a pretty large experience of boys, and you're a bad lot of fellows. Miss, I shall talk to you about your passage to France. I'll be right there, Mr. Jaggers. I wish I knew when you were coming back, Estella. And I wish... Well, what do you wish? I wish I could kiss you goodbye. We'll try it and see what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Blacksmith. My boyhood had ended, and my life as a blacksmith began. I was happy enough, especially when Joe brought Biddy into our house, as the new Mrs. Joe, a trusted friend of both of us and a blessing on the household. In the sixth year of my apprenticeship, I saw Mr. Jaggers again. He came to the cottage asking to see Joe and me alone. So you are the blacksmith, eh? By name Joseph or Joe Gargaret? Uh, yes, sir. Have you an apprentice commonly known as Pip? Uh, I'm Pip, sir. So you're Pip. Uh, my name is Jaggers. I'm a lawyer of London. you better close that door. Uh, yes, sir. Now, Joseph Gargaret, I am the bearer of an offer to relieve you of this young fellow. You would not object to cancelling his apprenticeship for his own good? You would want nothing for so doing? Oh, heaven forbid that I should want anything for not standing in Pip's way. He always a fine, good lad, sir. Very well, then. And I come now to the young fellow himself. To him, I say that he has great expectations. I am instructed to inform him that he will come into a handsome property. Pip! Wait, Joe, wait. Further, it is the desire of the present possessor of that property that he shall be immediately removed from his present sphere and brought up as befits a young gentleman, and that he always bear the name of Pip. Do you have any objection? Mention it now. Uh, I have no objections. I should think not indeed. Uh, further, Mr. Pip, you are to understand that the name of the person who is your benefactor is to remain a profound secret until the person chooses to reveal it. Yes, sir. Do you have any suspicion as to whom that person might be? Keep that suspicion within your own breast, sir. Well, Mr. Pip? Uh, I have no objection. Now then, uh, kindly consider me your guardian. <laughs> 
Thank you, sir. Let me tell you, I am well paid for my services. Otherwise, I should not render them. I shall arrange for you to come to London in two weeks. You uh, will need some new clothes. Uh, here, sir, 20 guineas. Well, Joseph Gargery, you look dumbfounded. Hey, sir, I am. Then good night, Mr. Gargery. Good night, Mr. Pip. And since I start for London tomorrow, Miss Havisham, I thought you would kindly not mind my taking leave of you. Well, Pip. Well, I must say your new clothes are quite handsome. Miss Havisham, I have come into wonderful good fortune since I've saw you. I have seen Mr. Jaggers, Pip. I've heard all about it. Have you had any news from Estella? Oh, yes. Prettier than ever, I dare say. And admired by all who see her. You, too, have a promising career. Be good and deserve it. Yes, Miss Havisham. Thank you, Miss Havisham. Thank you for everything. Goodbye, Joe. Goodbye, Biddy. God bless you, dear old Pip. God bless you. Take care, boy. Take good care. Uh, one day I'll come and see you in London, Pip. <laughs> what larks, eh? Goodbye. Joe. Who's behind all this? Who could it be, Joe? Uh, you'd best not worry your head over that, love. Just wave goodbye to a young gentleman. A young gentleman of great expectations. <laughs> You'll hear Act Two of Great Expectations in a moment. You know, our servicemen overseas have a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions. And they find, too, that these ideas of other people aren't so strange after all. Take, for example, the foods that people eat or uh, don't eat. Among many people, the eating of beef or pork is absolutely taboo. Among others, any flesh may be eaten except that from animals with cloved hooves. Some groups will eat fish only if they have scales. Everybody has his favorite food, too, such delicacies as fish heads in Japan, frog's legs in France, or pig's knuckles in Germany. All these things might sound strange, but as our servicemen have observed, there are reasons for them. The reasons may be religious, as in the case of not eating pork, or they may be based on dietary rules from the standpoint of health. We have the same thing in our own culture. You like a big stack of hot cakes for breakfast covered with plenty of melted butter and maple syrup. But your wife finds she can lose a couple of pounds where it counts by eating a half a grapefruit and a cup of black coffee. Then we have our food fattists, the people who advise wheat germ or stone ground flour or a big helping of blackstrap molasses. If it makes them feel better, then that's the right diet for them. You can add to the list the thousands of vegetarians. They get along fine without T-bone steaks. And many of our religious groups follow certain rules as regards food. The Orthodox Jews refrain from eating pork products. Catholics abstain from eating meat on Friday. Other orders have certain days for fasting. Well, what is true about food habits around the world is true also of other customs and traditions. The way of doing things may be different, but the ideals are the same. And they're important to the people who follow them. Our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill by observing the customs of other people in other lands. Now, our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of Great Expectations, starring Rock Hudson as Pip and Barbara Rush as Estella. London. The glory and wonder of London. And I was a part of it now. Or rather, soon would be. Upon my arrival, I went at once to the offices of Mr. Jaggers. So you have arrived safely, Mr. Pip. Well, we shall soon settle you. Wemmick, bring the file on Mr. Pip. Yes, sir. You are scrutinizing my office, Mr. Pip. Oh, I, I beg your pardon, sir. Those clay masks that you see on the wall, they are death masks, Mr. Pip. Deceased clients. I have had the honor, sir, of defending some of the most distinguished criminals of the generation. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Pip's file, sir. Mr. Pip Wemmick here will conduct you to Barnard's Inn. 
You will share rooms there with a Mr. Herbert Pocket. Yes, sir. Mr. Pocket will assist in your acquaintance and the manners of London. I take it this is agreeable? Indeed, sir. Next money. Your allowance will be £250 per annum. A very handsome sum of money, too, I think. Undoubtedly, Mr. Jaggers. Of course, you'll go wrong somehow, but that being neither fault nor affair of mine, why spend time talking about it, eh? Goodbye, then, Mr. Pip, and good luck. My rooms in Barnard's Inn were most comfortable, and the young man I shared them with, Herbert Pocket, most amiable. After supper that night, we suddenly found ourselves staring at each other. Why, why, you're the boy. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're the boy. The boy who knocked me down in Miss Havisham's garden. I knew I'd seen you someplace before. Well, then... Instead of new friends, we're old friends. If Miss Havisham had taken a liking to me instead of you, suppose I should have been provided for. I might even be engaged to Estella. Herbert, who is Estella? Why, Miss Havisham's ward. Brought up by Miss Havisham to wreck revenge on all the male sex. Wreck revenge? Good heavens, Pip, I thought you knew. Knew what? Oh, dear me. Anyway, some 20 years ago, Miss Havisham fell passionately in love with a stranger. The marriage was arranged, the wedding date was set, and the day of the marriage arrived, but not the bridegroom. Instead, he sent a note and bade her farewell. Miss Havisham fell immediately ill. And when she recovered, if ever she did, she laid the whole place waste, as you have seen it, and has never since looked upon the light of day. But when did she adopt Estella? I don't know. You know as much about Estella as I do. <laughs> If I learned little from Herbert about Estella, I learned a great deal of the art of being a useless young gentleman. On my 21st birthday, Mr. Jaggers, my guardian, sent for me. Sit down, Mr. Pip. Now then, what do you suppose you are living at the rate of? At the rate of, Mr. Jaggers? The rate of. I, uh, I'm afraid I'm not able to answer that. <laughs> I thought so. Well, I've asked you a question. Have you a question to ask of me? It would be a great relief to ask you several questions, Mr. Jaggers, if it were not forbidden. Ask one. Is my benefactor to be made known to me today? No, ask me another. Well, uh, I was wondering if I had anything to receive. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I thought we should come to that. Wemmick. Oh, yes, sir. Mr. Pip, you have been spending pretty freely of late and are in debt, of course. I, I'm afraid I must say yes, sir. You know you must say yes. Yes, sir. Wemmick, hand Mr. Pip that piece of paper. Thank you. Tell me what it is, Mr. Pip. It's a banknote. A banknote for 500 pounds. And at the rate of that handsome sum per annum, and at no higher rate, you are to live until your benefactor appears. Um... Will it still be years hence, Mr. Jaggers? I cannot answer that. Good afternoon, Mr. Pip. It was soon after that Joe Gargery wrote me a letter. He was coming to London. Of a sudden, I realized I was ashamed of Joe. In trying to become a gentleman, I had succeeded only in becoming a snob. Pip, I'd... Luke... Pip, I, I've been here all day, sir, and Joe, I... Joe, how can you call me, sir? Well, you treated me fine, sir, but, Pip, I don't belong here. I, I wouldn't have come except Miss Havisham sent me. Miss Havisham? Uh, would you tell Mr. Pip, she says, that I wish to see him for I have something to disclose to him? Well, I've now concluded, sir, and Pip... You're going, Joe? Pip, old chap, you, you and me is not two figures to be seen together in London. I, I'm wrong away from it, Forge. You may stay the night if you wish. No, no. God bless you, dear old Pip, old chap. God bless you. The next day, I presented myself once again at Havisham House. Pip, come in, Pip. How good to see you. How do you do, Miss Havisham? Well, have you no eyes but for me? Look about you. Estella. Good afternoon, Pip. What a wonderful surprise and pleasure. You will both have a lot to say to each other. Go out in the garden, both of you. And this is where you had the fight that day with Herbert Pocket. <laughs> I enjoyed that battle very much. You rewarded me very much. Did I? Don't you remember? No. Do you remember? No, I th don't. Do you remember the first time I came here? The time you made me cry. 
I made you cry. You don't remember? You meant nothing to me. Why should I remember? Oh, you must realize, Pip, that I have no heart. Perhaps that's why I have no memory. No one looking at you could believe that, Estella. No sympathy, no feelings. And if we are to be thrown together, you had better believe that at once. I cannot believe it. Well, at any rate, it's said, so don't expect too much of me. <laughs> Come, Pip, we'll walk once more around the garden. Is she beautiful, Pip? Graceful, well-grown. Do you admire Estella Pip? Everyone must who sees her, Miss Havisham. She is going to London soon. Then I shall be the happiest man there. Love her. If she favors you, love her. If she tears your heart to pieces, love her. I made her to be loved, Pip. I called briefly upon Joe and Biddy and returned to London. A week later, it was my unbounded pleasure to extend my arm to Estella as she stepped off the coach from Surrey. We sat and talked in a nearby coffee house. But what do you mean, Estella? You are not staying in London? I mean that I shall be staying in Richmond. Oh, praise heaven, only ten miles from here. But why Richmond? Well, I'm going to live at a great expense with a lady there who has the power of showing me to people and people to me. You will have a gay time, Estella. Well, it is a part of Miss Havisham's plan for me. Oh, but I cannot take great pleasure, Pip, in events I do not shape. But I will try to be beautiful and gay and obedient. Will you always be a part of Miss Havisham's plan? And do you thrive with Mr. Pocket, Pip? Stella, I asked if you will always be a part. And I ask, do you thrive with Mr. Pocket? Well, it's pleasant enough. At least it's... A... Yes? As pleasant as anywhere away from you. With Estella so near London, I was able to see her often in the months that followed. But I was only one of the many admirers. One winter's night, Estella's patroness gave a ball. <laughs> you dance beautifully, Pip. I'm sorry now I've promised the poker to Mr. Drummle. Drummle? He never takes his eyes off you. Look at him. Is there anything about Drummle that I need to look at? That's a question I've wanted to ask you for weeks. Ever since he started hovering over you. All sorts of ugly creatures hover about a lighted candle. Can the candle help it? It makes me wretched, Estella. You give him looks and smiles such as you never give me. Do you want me then to deceive and entrap you? Do you deceive and entrap him, Estella? Yes, and many others, Pip. All of them but you. Late that same night, I went back to London. Herbert had not yet come home. I thought it was his knock that I heard on my door. But when I opened the door, an old man stood before me, his long white hair and his black cloak dripping with rain. Mr. Pip. Hi, Mr. Pip. What's your business here? I'd like to sit down first. It's disappointing to a man after having come so far. I don't know what you mean, sir. Wait. Is there anyone else about? Why do you ask that? Uh, uh, you're a gayman, Pip. I'm glad you grew up to be a gayman. There's no one here. Look at me. Who am I? Well, how do I know who you... The churchyard. The convict I gave food to. <laughs> I, uh, you acted noble, Pip, and I never forgot it. Never. There was... No need for you to come here to thank me. I wanted to see you again. If I, if I spoke harshly to you just now, I, I'm sorry. Um, how have you been living? Well, I've been a sheep farmer far away in New South Wales. I, I hope you've done well. I've done wonderful well. <laughs> me and a Skype convict. I, I, I'm very glad. Uh, I hope to hear you say so, dear boy. You've done well, too, eh? Quite well. I've been chosen to succeed to some property. Uh -huh. May I ask what property? I don't know. May I ask whose property? I don't know that either. Could I make a guess, I wonder, at your income since you've come of age, huh? Eh? Say, 500 pounds? Yes, but... And your guardian? Could it be he's a lawyer, Pip? As to the first letter of that lawyer's name now, would it be J? 
How do you know this? As to the employer of that lawyer whose name begins with J and might be Jaggers. You! It's you! Hi, ah, dear boy. Yes, Pip, it's me what's done it. You give me your hand, Pip. Let me hold it. Uh... <laughs> oh, I swore that time, sure as I'd ever escape again and own a guinea, that guinea should go to you. That there hunted dog, which you kept life in, caught his head so high that he could make a gentleman. <laughs> and Pip, you're him. Didn't you ever think it might be me? No. Never. No one else. Oh, uh, Miss Havisham, perhaps. No one else, dear boy. Single and it. <laughs> Your second father, Pip. Me. <laughs> Is it so early in the day? I must talk to you, Mr. Jaggers. Alone. Molly? Yes, sir. Get out. I said get out. Clean up later on. I'll get out. Who was that woman? I've never seen her here before. She's been here before for years, Mr. Pip. I once saved her from the hangman. Now she cleans my office. Well? Mr. Jaggers, last night I had a caller... I want to assure myself that what I've been told is true. Did you say told or informed? Told would imply verbal communication. You can't have verbal communication with a man, for example, in New South Wales. Uh, I will say informed, then. I have been informed by a person named Abel Magwitch that he is the benefactor so long unknown to me. That is the man in New South Wales. Well, wherever he is. I've always supposed it was Miss Havisham. Well, have you now? Why? Not a particle of evidence, Pip. Take nothing on supposition. Take everything on evidence. Well, you have nothing more to say. I will say this. I think you should know that I communicated with Mr. Abel Magwitch in New South Wales, reminding him that if he should ever set foot again in this country, he would be liable to immediate execution. Take a look out that window, Pip. Yonder you'll see the prison yard. What is occurring in the prison yard? Horrible. They're preparing to hang... Surely not all those people. Eight, I believe, this morning. Happens every day. Magwitch has enemies here who would not hesitate to inform on an escaped convict. There is a reward for such as want it. I see. But... No doubt he has guided himself by my caution and has remained in New South Wales. But if Mr. Magwitch were in this country, he would have to be got out of this country at once, would he not? If he were here and anyone cared about him, yes, at once. Then what has to be done must be done. Good day, Mr. Jaggers. <laughs> You probably remember when the waves of the North Sea burst through Holland's dikes and turned the little country into a land of terror. It was Western Europe's worst flood disaster. More than 1,400 people were killed, and over 60,000 were made homeless. The property loss was greater than that suffered during World War II. But America answered the call from the Dutch people. Within just a few hours, United States Army helicopters were evacuating hundreds from the danger areas. Mercy planes filled with blankets, coats, shoes, and food brought quick relief in the emergency. Among the many who contributed was the 82nd Airborne Division. They remembered the courage and the help displayed by the Dutch people when they parachuted into Holland in 1944. This one unit collected nearly 20,000 pounds of clothing and over $12,000 in cash for relief in the flooded country. Now, there was no official drive behind this operation... It emerged right from the heart, a spontaneous, genuine reaction to a country struck by disaster. It proved once more that in the hour of need, people will reach across borders and oceans to help their fellow men. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. We pause now for station identification.
curtain rises on Act Three of Great Expectations, starring Rock Hudson as Pip and Barbara Rush as Estella. At last I had the truth. I knew my benefactor, and I knew he was now risking his life only that he might see me. I had but one course to follow. Somehow I must get Abel Magwitch out of England and remain at his side as long as he lived. With one man only did I share the secret, Herbert Pocket. Leaving him to share Mr. Magwitch, I sought Estella. I found her at Havisham House. We have company, Miss Havisham. Look. Pip! And what brings you here, Mr. Pip? So glumly. I have found out who my benefactor is, Miss Havisham. I as un- unhappy as ever you could have wished me to be. Well, who is he? It is not for me to say. Well, then. When Mr. Jaggers... Mr. Jaggers had nothing to do with it. His being my lawyer and the lawyer of your patron is coincidence. Yet for all this time, you've led me on. Yes, I led you on. Was that kind? Who am I, for heaven's sake, that I should be kind? What little more I have to say is for Estella. I would have spoken sooner, Estella. But I believed that Miss Havisham meant us for one another. I felt I could not tell you my real feelings, while you were not free to choose for yourself. But now that I am going away, I can speak. I have loved you, Estella, since I first came into this house. And I have warned you not to love me. But you would not be warned. Is it true that Bentley Drummle is here in Surrey pursuing you? Quite true. And that you encourage him to do so? Quite true. You cannot fling yourself at such a man. Should I fling myself at you, Pip? Who would sense at once that I can bring nothing to you? But you you can't love him, Estella. Well, I am going to marry him. Oh, Pip, don't be afraid of my being a blessing to him. I shall not be that. Here. Here is my hand. Let us part on that. You'll get me out of your thoughts in a week. Goodbye, Pip. Let her go, Pip. What have I done? What have I done? I had not reached the gate of Havisham House when a frightful scream sent me rushing back. I heard a window shatter and saw a sheet of angry flame and the terrified face of Miss Havisham as the fire enveloped her. I dashed to the room and carried her out and went back a second time to smother the flames. A falling candle must have started the fire. But Miss Havisham could not say. Miss Havisham was dead. When I returned to London, I was summoned immediately by Mr. Jaggers. I had you come to my house for good reason, Mr. Pip. How do things fare at Barnard's Inn? Why do you ask? Because I have just got word that an old enemy of of a certain convict knows of his presence here in London. I have been watched. I also heard that you are being watched. I? And might be watched again. So I advised a certain Mr. Herbert Pocket to get a certain individual out of the way while you were out of the way. Where are they? I shall take you there tonight. That night I joined them, Mr. Magwitch and our faithful friend Herbert Pocket. They were near Gravesend, hiding away in an obscure lodging house on the Thames River. It was here that we planned our escape. Twice a week... A packet boat left Gravesend Pier and crossed the channel into France. If someone was watching us, he'd be at that pier. We had to find some other way of boarding the packet boat. Far down the river was a buoy. Here, we observed, a a boat could always stop to drop the river pilot, and on occasion to take on more passengers. That was where we would have to go aboard. Daily, Herbert and I went rowing in the river, becoming familiar figures to any who might otherwise suspect us. At last came the day we had waited for. But with it, stormy winds and heavy rain... Clock. Still have time if the storm lit up. How does it look from the window, Pip? Mm, black as ever. The river's too rough. That seed swamp us before we could... What is it, boy? On the beach. Two men on horseback. They're looking at this house. They're taking notes. No, no, stay where you are. Police? I can't say. I think so. Wait! They're going now. They're walking their horses. This way? No, toward town. They can't be too sure of themselves they'd go at a gallop. Storm or no storm, get ready, sir. We're rowing out this morning. Hey, the storm stopped, Pip. Our luck's with us. Once we locate the buoy, we'll be all right. Row, Pip. Right or, man. Right or. Tell me something, Mr. Magwitch. What, dear boy? What I did for you as a child was such a small matter. Why have you done so much for me? I had a child of my own once, Pip. 
a little girl who I loved and lost. What happened to her? I don't know. But when on those lone, shivering marshes, a boy was kind to a half-starved convict, that boy took the place of the child he'd lost. There's That's the boy, Pip. Straight ahead. We've made it. There's another boat already there. A dory. Hold your oars, Herbert. Sighted us, Pip. Who could it be? We'll not wait to find out. Swing around. Oh, Don't answer. They're coming after us. You have an escape from it there. I call upon him to surrender and you to ascend. We'll head for the fog bank, Herbert. We can still lose them. Stop! In the name of the king! Stop! There were four men at the oars of the dory. It was just a matter of time before they'd be upon us. Then, through the fog, we heard the engines of the packet boat. It was bearing straight down upon us. There was one desperate chance to take. Row straight for the steamer in the hope our pursuers, fearful of being run down, would rest their oars. But if they too heard the ship, it deterred them not one instant. They were not ten feet from it when the packet boat leaped from the mist and crushed us both to splitters. Next I knew, we were aboard the steamer. Mr. Magwitch was lying on the deck. His wrists, uh, once again, bound <coughs> by chains. <coughs> They're taking us back, Pip. I'll never forgive myself for this. I'm all right. I'm content to have seen my boy and took my chance. Jaggers will help you, sir. Don't worry. Jaggers will get you off all right. <laughs> Prisoner at the bar will stand and come forward. Mr. Jaggers. The law is the law, Mr. Pip. We have been defeated. Abel Magwitch, the sentence of the court is that you shall be taken hence to the place of execution and there hanged by the neck until you are dead. just come from the warden, Pip. He'll be hanged day after tomorrow. There's nothing we can do. Nothing. But he may cheat the hangman yet. The old man is quite ill, Pip. I know. You, uh, you realize, of course, that you will no longer inherit his fortune. That becomes the claim of the crown. The money is not no interest to me. If you had been a blood relation, it might have been different. But it is not different. You mean, if he had a child, the money might go to the child? The money might go to the child. There was a child, Mr. Jaggers. I know there was. And what is more, you know it too. Pip, sit down. I'm going to put a case to you. Put the case that a woman is charged with a murder. Put the case that this woman has a child whose father is a convict. Go on. Now put the case that this woman's legal advisor knows an eccentric and very rich lady who is about to adopt a little girl. You understand, Mr. Pip? No admissions, but do you understand? I understand, but I can hardly believe it. Ring that bell. Observe who comes in. Yes, sir. Some fresh water in the basin, Molly. I shall wash before dining. Yes, sir. Well, Pip? Would you hazard a statement? If I am in my right mind, if that woman you call Molly is Estella's mother, then this legal advisor you mentioned will have a lot to answer for. Now, put the case of this legal advisor, who has often seen children tried at the criminal bar. Put the case that he's known them to be habitually imprisoned, whipped and cast out, qualified in all ways for the hangman and growing up to be hanged. Put the case that here was one pretty little child out of all that miserable heap that could be saved. Put that last case to yourself very carefully. I do, Mr. Jaggers. Did the legal advisor do right? He did right. Does Estella know? You mean, does the little girl know? No, she does not know. She must never be told. As to her claim to her father's property, the legal advisor must use his own judgment. 
which he is in the process of arriving at and will, in due course of time, use. Meanwhile, you will find the child's father in the prison infirmary. Oh, oh dear boy. Oh, I thought you wasn't coming. <laughs> Yet somehow I knew that you would. I've been waiting permission from the warden. Oh, God bless you, Pip. You've never deserted me. And what's best of all, you've been more comfort to me since I was under this dark cloud than when the sun shone. That's best of all. Are you in pain, sir? I don't complain of none, dear boy. I have something to say to you. Can you understand me? Uh, uh, I, I... You had a child once whom you loved and lost. She lived, sir. Uh? She is a lady now and very beautiful. And I love her. Uh? Oh, Pip. <coughs> You're on, Pip. You're on. Mr. Magwitch. Mr. Magwitch. Be merciful to him, O Lord. Be merciful. Abel Magwitch died in my arms. I remember walking back to Mr. Jagger's office and suddenly finding the room spinning before my eyes and my legs turning to water. When my senses returned, I was in my boyhood room and Joe Gargery was smiling over me. You bet it, Pip. Your fever's gone, old chap. Joe. It is Joe. Which it are, old chap? Uh, I'm in your house, Joe. Three weeks and more, Pip, and almost dead. We brought you home, dear old Pip, old chap, Biddy and me. After the way I turn from you, you break my heart, Joe. Ah, ever the best of friends, Pip, come what may. Soon you'll be well again, and then coo, what larks, eh? Biddy. Right here, Pip, dear. You have the best husband in the world, Biddy. And Joe, the best wife. Which I know, Pip, old chap, which I know. One day you'll marry two, Pip. No, Biddy. I don't think so. You still fret for her, Estella. I think of her. But that poor dream has all gone by. Has all gone by. I knew as I said these words that I intended to visit the great old house the first day I could get on my feet. When that day came and I walked through the dark corridors, they were filled with echoes of years gone by. What name? Pumblechook. Quite right. Sometimes I have sick fancies. I would like to see someone play. Don't loiter, boy. You can break his heart. A coarse, common, laboring boy. I hate you. I hate you. I opened the door of Miss Havisham's room. For one frantic moment, I thought I saw her there. Miss Havisham sitting in her chair. Come in, Pip. Stella. Stella. I thought you were in Paris with your husband. I have no husband, Pip. Haven't you heard? Well, I've been ill, Estella. I've heard nothing. When Mr. Jaggers disclosed to Bentley Drummel who my parents were, he no longer wished to have me for a wife. Well, Pip, why don't you laugh? You have every right. I have no wish to laugh, Estella. Oh, you've no need to pity me. This house is mine now. And I shall live here, away from the world and all its complications. Estella, how long have you been here? I... I don't know. You must leave this house. It's a dead house. Nothing can live here, Estella. This is the house where I grew up. It's part of me. It's my home. It was Miss Havisham's home. But she's gone. Gone from both of us. Oh, she's not gone. She is still here. In this very room. Then I defy her. I have come back, Miss Havisham. I have come back to let the sunlight in. Oh, Pip. I shall open the drapes, Miss Havisham. 
and she'll rip down the drapes. There is sunshine in your house again, Miss Havisham. The sunlight is streaming through. <laughs> oh, Stella. Oh, my God. I'm afraid. Look at me. We will start again, Estella. Together. Come with me, Estella. Out into the sunlight. In a moment, our stars will return. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. There's hardly a home in western Germany, for instance, which doesn't reflect the influence of Ellen McCloy, wife of our former high commissioner to Germany. When Mrs. McCloy arrived in Germany in 1949, she decided to be more than just the wife of the high commissioner. There were nearly 10 million outcasts in the western area. Refugees from the occupied countries, bewildered people who needed guidance and encouragement. Mrs. McCloy knew that big problems can be solved from small beginnings. So she bought a few sewing machines and opened a sewing room where the women could make warm winter clothing for their families. Well, the sewing room was an immediate success. As they sewed, the women discussed common interests, found new friends. Within a year, 30 more sewing rooms were begun in the United States Zone. Early in 1950, Mrs. McCloy began a series of visits which took her into every town in the U.S. zone, as well as the French and British areas. She spoke to the women, told them how American women lived and how they became good citizens. She spoke honestly with German housewives and pulled them out of the depths of self-pity by showing them the meaning of neighborliness. Well, these are but a few examples of what she did to help those who needed help. During her three-year stay in Germany... Mrs. McCloy did much to assure the future of German democracy. As one German housewife put it, for us Germans, Frau McCloy is better even than the Marshall Plan. Yes, Ellen McCloy had proved that by helping others, you help your country. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. And now that they've fulfilled our great expectations, Rock Hudson and Barbara Rush take a bow. We certainly enjoy doing the show, Mr. Cummings. Next week, Arlene Dahl, on the Radio Theatre. Coaster Horing with that brilliant newcomer, Richard Burton. And as our play, we have chosen one of the great love stories of all time. 20th Century Fox's Im impressive drama of the star-crossed lovers, David and Bathsheba. And that's one I won't miss. Good night. Good night. Good night. It was wonderful seeing you again. Heard in our cast tonight were Bill Conrad as Magwitch, Jeanette Nolan as Miss Havisham, Alan Reed as Jaggers, Peter Votrian as Pip as a child, Susan Seaforth as Estella as a child, Christopher Cook as Herbert as a child, Harley Bear as Joel, and B.B. Janice, Jimmy McCallion, Lillian Bayef, Norman Field, Howard McNair, Leo Britt, and Eddie Marr. Hollywood Radio Theater is produced by Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is directed by Rudy Schrager. This is your announcer, Ken Carpenter, inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. <laughs>